Good evening, everyone. I'm Gretchen Crosby Sims, the executive director here at the Institute of Politics. We are so pleased to welcome this all-star panel to campus for a preview of the 2020 presidential election. Enrique Acevedo has been a Pritzker fellow at the IOP this quarter. And our former fellow, Mark Murray, has returned to campus to moderate. Thank you both for joining us. And we are delighted to welcome Laura Baron Lopez, who's joining us for the first time. Lisa Desjardins from PBS was unfortunately grounded in DC by um, some impeachment developments. So we're sorry to miss her. I do want to mention some upcoming events. Um, Bill Browder and former fellow Vladimir Karamurtz, it's our, it's our fellows week, um, will be talking on Friday about Russian international influence today and particularly their common experiences of being targeted by the Kremlin. Next Monday, David Sanger of the New York Times will be interviewing the State Department's Brian, Brian Hook about uh, US foreign policy with Iran. For more information on these events and others, please visit our website at politics.uchicago.edu and sign up for our newsletter. And if you're a student who's particularly interested in elections uh, and tonight's election focus program and you want to join a nonpartisan student-led um, effort to increase voter turnout in the 2020 elections, please go to ushivotes.com to learn more about how to pitch in or to register. Audience questions, we will have some after our moderated conversation. We will um, have a microphone in the center aisle. Please remember that everyone's welcome at the mic, uh, but that the first three questions do go to students and will end in question marks. Please make sure that your phones are on silent and restrooms are downstairs if you need them. And now here to formally introduce our panel is Noah Levine. Noah is a third year from Nyack, New York, studying political science and human rights. This year, she is a co-editor in chief of The Gate, UChicago's undergraduate political review. Please join me in welcoming Noah to the podium. Thank you. We are witnessing one of the most consequential election cycles in our country's history. Debates over centrism and electability plague the Democratic Party, while moderate Republicans face the decision of whether to rally around President Trump for a second term. Our country is seemingly more polarized than ever. For many young Americans, this is the first presidential election in which they will be able to vote, and their choices could dramatically alter how we look at American politics in years to come. As we head into the primary elections and then the general, understanding what is at stake uh, and making an informed decision is paramount. Today, we have the privilege of hearing from the journalists who can provide us with experience-based answers to all of the important questions surrounding the elections. Enrique Acevedo is an anchor for Univision and was named one of the top Latinos in American newsrooms by the Huffington Post. He has covered major world events, including three US presidential elections and the drug wars in Latin America, and has profiled and interviewed many world leaders like President Barack Obama, Kofi Annan, Melinda Gates, and Desmond Tutu. He is also one of the fall 2019 IOP resident Pritzker Fellows. Laura Baron Lopez is a national political reporter for Politico who covers congressional campaigns and the 2020 presidential race. She previously covered topics like criminal justice reform in the Senate and in 2018 traveled to the competitive districts that went blue in the 2018 midterm elections. Before her current job at Politico, she wrote for the Washington Examiner, HuffPost, and The Hill. Our panel today will be moderated by Mark Murray, who is a senior political editor for NBC News. Mr. Murray writes for and edits the network's blog, First Read, and serves as one of their key managers for its political coverage. In spring 2018, he was a Pritzker Fellow here at the IOP. It is my honor and pleasure to welcome our panelists for a necessary conversation about the role of political journalism and the future of American democracy. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Noah, thanks for that kind introduction. We're now a year removed from the 2020 uh, presidential election. We're fewer than 100 days before Iowa and New Hampshire. I'm someone, as a political journalist, I actually like to be able to count the votes. Uh, and as sometimes we often end up talking about elections that take two or three years before we finally get to that vote counting stage. But we are actually here at the next best thing, is to being able to talk about it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I, I want to turn to both of you for your experiences on the ground, interviewing candidates, more importantly, interviewing voters. And one of the big questions as we look ahead to the Democratic primary debates and also the contests in Iowa, New Hampshire, and beyond, what do Democratic primary voters and Democratic voters want? And Laura, I kind of, from your conversation with some of those voters, I, I haven't been able to figure it out, and I wonder if you have. Well, I think uh, 
it's difficult to tell what they want. Um, there are a number of them who still very much focus on healthcare when you're speaking to them. That still is very front of mind for them, which was a big theme of the 2018 midterms. It was something that pushed um, a lot of voters to go to the polls as well as gun control. I remember speaking to a number of mothers who had never been politically active before in places like Virginia and for the first time were deciding to come out and vote. Uh, and in house races that ultimately flipped, they went from red to blue and they were very, uh, very red to begin with. So uh, it's a lot of those same issues because uh, Democratic primary voters know that just having control of one chamber doesn't mean that you ultimately get what you want passed or across the aisle, because Republicans still control the White House and still control the Senate. So uh, you, you very rarely hear about impeachment. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. not sure if you, you two have different uh, examples, but I, I have almost never heard Democratic primary voters raise that issue at all. They're still very much focused on certain policy. Um, certain policies. But I think that there is clearly this debate, which you see reflected in the candidates, where there's a section of the base and younger progressives you know, across all ethnic ethnicities that very much want a more aggressive candidate. They want someone who is going to push back harder on Republicans, uh, since Republicans have moved very far to the right. Mm -hmm. And uh, then there are the older Democrats who are afraid that what happened in 2016 will happen again. And in a way, they're almost just driven by pure fear. And that's why they are flocking to what they consider to be safer candidates. Yeah, Enrique, I've kind of almost seen this kind of dichotomy between revolution that Bernie Sanders is calling for, or Elizabeth Warren's fundamental change, versus the kind of Joe Biden, we just want the restoration, let's bring 2016 back again. <laughs> Status uh, quo kind of thing. But also from an ideological standpoint, it does seem to me that Laura was talking about the 2018 midterms, and Democrats had a simple blueprint. They're talking about health care. They actually wanted that we want to protect and defend Obamacare. We're going to tell you that, that Donald Trump's going to take it away from you. It does seem that we've moved well beyond that 2018 playbook to a kind of a different ideological debate inside the Democratic Party. And it makes you scratch your head because it worked so well for Democrats, especially in key uh, states and, 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 and um, districts. So I think that they did, you know, stayed away from that uh, strategy. They have stayed away from that strategy lately. And uh, if you look at polls just today, uh, I saw that around 60% of, of voters think that the election should be the way that President Trump is eventually removed from power and not an impeachment. So. Um, that speaks to, to the, the, the perils of this impeachment just um, uh, you know, moving forward and, and sort of contaminating the electoral year and, and, and the primary process for Democrats. It's not like they have control over what's going to happen, but I think that the more the impeachment uh, runs over next year, the, the less they, they, they really control the message. Uh, and just following up on some of your expertise, you know, to me, I do think that we put so much of a primacy on what do Iowa Democratic voters think? What do mm. New Hampshire uh, Democratic voters think? With your discussions in the Latino community, and this is also too for you, Laura, what do Latino voters actually want and what are the issues that they're demanding? Uh, it's, I think, pretty much the same as, as the you know, general electorate. They mm. are, of course, concerned about uh, jobs, the economy, healthcare, education also national security issues, foreign affairs issues. Um, I think immigration is not a priority for Latinx voters, but it's certainly a, a personal issue, a, a, an identity issue for them. Uh, so I, I would expect you know, places like Texas, for example, to, it happened in 2018 during the midterms, to have a, a, a larger registration of voters and hopefully a, a bigger participation from this segment of the electorate in 2020 because of some of the immigration policies that we've seen, like family separation, uh, the rates, the, the, the idea of mass deportation that has not materialized, but it's still there. Uh, and, and I think is, this, in a way, energizes that segment of the electorate. And just to answer part of the, the first question also, mm -hmm. which was, Laura was talking about, um, I don't know what voters want, but I do know that it's going to be very different from what they end up uh, wanting the day of the election. And that usually proves to be true every election cycle. Just imagine where we were a year before the 2016 election and what happened during those tw last 12 months 
The same goes for the, for the um, 2008 election, so 2012, 2008. It, it usually changes a lot, and, and so I'd be a little careful to make any predictions at this point. <laughs> Yeah. Uh, when it comes to Latino voters, I mean, in 2018, they turned out in greater numbers than they had in the previous midterm, and they're on pace to become the largest non-white eligible uh, voting bloc. So they could surpass black voters in 2020. It will remain to be seen if they actually do. But um, so a lot of the Latinos that I speak to, as Enrique said, they, they definitely have a lot of the same concerns as the wider dem, you know, electorate, which is um, health care, minimum wage, uh, being able to find city jobs. Yes, younger ones are much more concerned about student uh, mm -hmm. loan debt. So those are the issues that they raise on a consistent basis. Uh, and I can talk about it now because the embargo lifted, but there it was a, um, a Noticias Telemundo poll that just came out today that uh, found, interestingly, that Trump is kind of remaining steady in his support among Latino voters at about 25%. He got 28% of them in 2016. And uh, Biden and Sanders top the field. Um, but a, a vast majority of Latinos, and even independent ones that identify as independents, and that's where when I'm looking at polls, um, for however much uh, credibility you do want to, or weight you want to apply to just one specific poll, I, I look a lot at where independents are. Um, so it, Latinos that identify as independents, about, if I remember this correctly, 54% or so of them uh, supported impeachment of Trump. Hmm and removing him from office, which I thought was interesting. And you mentioned Bernie Sanders, uh, Joe Biden leading the field. I want to kind of turn to the actual Democratic field, which started with some 20-odd candidates, an incredibly diverse group of folks. It does seem that we're now fewer than 100 days away. There is kind of a clear top four in Joe Biden, Elizabeth Warren, Bernie Sanders, and Pete Buttigieg. Mm -hmm. uh, and to me, one of the questions I want to pose to you guys is, how did we end up with this top four, knowing that it's not cement, you know, they're not cemented there, things can obviously change, but out of that kind of diverse field that we ended up with the candidate, the, these kind of four candidates you did, all four are white, you have three in their 70s, one who's 37 years old, uh, one Joe Biden is kind of the restoration, Pete Buttigieg is kind of that restoration model, the other the revolutionaries or change. How did we end up here? Uh well, I think that Joe Biden was probably always going to be in the top four uh, because of his name ID. You can't place enough of his, um, his sway on that. He was the vice president. He's the most well-known. He was Barack Obama's vice president. So that's a big deal, and that carries a lot of weight with voters. Uh, Sanders, again, was the second most well-known because of the fact that he had run against Hillary Clinton and that he did stir up a lot of support amongst the Democratic base. And then I think Warren's rise has been very strategic, very methodical. From the beginning, she, she has not really changed her strategy from the beginning. It was very focused on ground game, um, direct contact, uh, spending a lot of time with voters, putting as many boots on the ground in early states, uh, well ahead of a lot of her other rivals. Uh, and so she was very, and her plans, of course, are a mm -hmm. key part of that. And she was very much focused on that and hasn't wavered from it, which clearly has helped her because voters seem to be able to know, OK, I know what she stands for right off the bat. I can ID Warren, which is something that I think candidates like Harris and Booker and uh, Beto O'Rourke have struggled with. Right. Um, and then uh, Buttigieg, again, I think you know, there's been a lot of discussion about why he rose compo compared to Harris and Booker and these other senators who we expected to jump in. Uh, part of that is, um, I guess, it, it, I mean, presidential campaigns come down to, contests come down to popularity and their personality contests. And uh, Buttigieg, I think, has, seems to have reminded people of what they had when Obama was was in office, or, or very much, as you mentioned, uh, more of a unity candidate and trying to 
co bring all these coalitions together. You know, Enrique, you know, same question to you. And when I, back in March, when I was having conversations with sources and other journalists, I was telling people, I think the Democratic ticket is going to be some combination of Kamala Harris and Beto O'Rourke. <laughs> Boy, was I wrong about that. Uh, but, uh, you know, to me, and it kind of goes to show you just how much change and a lot of it also is dependent on the polls, that in right. a lot of ways, the people who've been able to rise up in the polls and have a moment, kind of like Pete Buttigieg did at that CNN town hall, have really benefited. And some of the other people, like Steve Bullock, the governor, two-term governor of Montana's raised his hand saying, hey, what about me? What's, what's going on here? Well, I, I think you're seeing that tension between electability and revolution play mm -hmm. out in these four uh, top candidates. Um, I, we were talking before coming on stage about how Biden's lead seems a little vulnerable at times. I think that he's just one mistake away from losing that, that lead. And then another poll comes out and it says he's actually you know, uh, breaking out of the, of the, the rest of the pack. Um, I, I, I don't know. I just think that if I, I, I know I said we have to be careful about making any predictions. But I, my prediction would be that Biden is not going to get the nomination because uh, I think that the, the party sort of settled for a candidate the last time around. They didn't buy the idea of revolution, of change that, by, uh, that Bernie was selling. And, and they're afraid of making, I think, that same mistake with, with Biden in 2019, well, for, for 2020. So, um, so I think Bernie, Warren, and then Pete Buttigieg, um, they, they have a better shot of uh, clinching the, the nomination. So Laura, uh, Enrique went down prediction way. Yeah. I, same, I, the, you can either make a prediction or tell us from your own reporting or things that you've actually seen some kind of indication that's out there in Iowa, New Hampshire, or elsewhere. It's going to be something to say, oh, we were, this was a big story that we weren't focused on now, but certainly ended up helping to determine who the nominee was. Um, that's difficult to answer. I don't really want to make a prediction. <laughs> but uh, I think that if the, if the primary or if the caucus in Iowa were held today, you know, it would be Warren. Warren would come out on top. Uh, and she and Sanders, one of those two, would come out on top in New Hampshire. Um, but as, when it comes to storylines, I think that what, where reporters are trying to course correct from 2016 is uh, very much focusing on not just white rural voters, but uh, on Latinos and on black voters and on black and Latino rural voters and, um, and show the public that your picture of black and brown voters is not uh, exactly accurate when it comes to who's voting in these primaries and in these in these states, and so I think that um, you know a big story of 2016 was the fact that that black voters didn't come out as much as they had in the prior election, and so making sure that we report on that and that we cover that, and I think that we have started to make those corrections. Um, so I hope that we aren't missing it as much this time around. Um, a big piece of what 2020 is going to be about, uh, based a lot on Trump, is is that he very much wants to make the election about racial identity and about uh, white grievance and, ab and uh, about these attacks on other minority groups. And that's something that reporters can't shy away from identifying and, uh, and talking to to those those groups as well. I, if I if I may, may add, um, Mark, I think an, uh, another story that we missed in 2016. It was reported, but we didn't understand its significance in the election was the meddling in the election, the interference, and how that worked out, um, how social media played a role, um, and, and you know how political ads, the way they were um, regulated or not regulated, um, actually end up affecting the result of the election. Um, how much, we really don't know yet, but um, I think that's also something that we're much more aware this time around. And, that we're all paying more attention to trying to, I guess, you know, perfect not just the way we report on it, but how we guard and protect our, our democratic process. If I could just add yeah. more, yeah, to Enrique's point, that reminded me that I think one story that probably actually isn't covered as much as it should be, or maybe not covered as much in um, 
very simple terms as it should be and alerting the public is just the disinformation exactly. that is going on. So uh, on top of potential meddling from foreign actors is the disinformation that campaigns use, um, primarily used by Republicans when it comes to the false um, the false information that they're putting across social media. And that is a huge element uh, that could impact the, uh, the election and, and sway voters in a way that they don't even realize. One final question about the Democratic field before we turn to the general election. And there was what I would kind of describe a freak out over the last 24 hours by the New York Times Siena polls that end up showing a really close race in some of the battlegrounds in Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania. Joe Biden only up two points in this collective of six states. You had uh, Bernie Sanders running even, Elizabeth Warren minus two, versus a lot of the national polls, including my own NBC Wall Street Journal poll that has all the candidates kind of in comfortable margins. In your conversations with voters and also with the candidates and campaign staffers, how freaked out are Democrats now about like the, what ended up happening in 2016? On, on one day, it's like, oh my gosh, we're totally going to destroy Donald Trump. The next day, oh, he's, he's going to end up winning. What, what, what well, are you guys hearing? They have to keep in mind that we have an electoral college, whether some of the candidates are asking to change that or not. The truth is that right now, that's how elections are decided. And sometimes national polls miss that. Uh, and you know, even though they, they, they were accurate in predicting uh, the, the result of the 20. Uh, the 16 election in the, the number of votes and the difference in the popular vote, they were not very accurate in, in, in predicting how the Electoral College was going to turn out. So the, the local polls, I think, tell a better story and are a, a clearer picture in that, in that sense. So I think it's actually more helpful for the campaigns to have that electoral map strategy running parallel to their national or popular vote strategy, much more conscious of that. That's what I've found from the campaigns, too. Um, you know, they're paying attention to those key states mm -hmm. and um, sort of having a, a, their math, working out their math to, those, that, to the magic number. I think uh, a lot of Democrats, you know, even before that New York Times Siena poll, have always had this steady level of freak out um, <laughs> when it comes to whether or not they, they will beat Trump. Uh, and, you know, you hear it from all of the groups, you hear it from black community leaders, Latino community leaders, Asian community leaders about, you know, uh, whether it's you're paying attention to these voting blocks and really doing outreach that'll get us out. Um, and if you don't, then, then you can't possibly beat Trump. And, and it's all of those things um, that I think is why they're freaked out. But again, like, this is where it's our job as reporters to provide the context with, with a poll like that, which is that one poll it's easy to freak out about one poll, but, but that things can dramatically change between now and Election Day, between now and the first um, primary and caucus contest. So uh, someone, uh, a professor, was circulating this, um, uh, an example of why don't freak out about one single poll was because uh, in around this time in 2011, like Romney was leading Obama by like five points or something, and Democrats freaked out, like, oh my God, Obama must have like thrown and totally messed up his reelection chances. So. If I remember correctly, Nate Silver had a New York Times Magazine piece like on <laughs> Obama on the cover. He is the underdog heading into this, and ended up winning by four mm -hmm. points mm -hmm. nationally. Uh -huh. uh, Enrique, there, I think this now is a perfect segue into President Trump and basically the state of Trump and what he brings to the table heading into the 2020 election. You know, when I look at my polls and others, what I find amazing is nothing really ever changes. Like whether you have an impeachment or Syria or whatnot, that in some ways his numbers almost never move, which in some ways has to probably, you know, he, he's not performing the way a winning incumbent often would. But he's also not out of it at all yet either. So what, what, what are your thoughts on Trump? He wasn't performing as the winning candidate either before the 2016 election and still won the, that election. I think um, when we talk about impeachment, for example, and, and the, the effect that might have on the uh, result of the election, we have to keep in mind that whatever happens to President Trump, to his presidency, his supporters are not going to change their mind. They're not going to abandon President Trump. And the same is true on the other side. Th those who don't like President Trump are not going to dislike him more because of the things that we found out during the last two or three years. So I guess the key here is who is going to vote and where, right? And we also talked about uh, that before coming on stage. 
um, and, and the people who come out to vote are really going to end up deciding the election where they come out to vote. Um, uh, impeachment, Syria are not going to be top of mind uh, when, when the election day comes. And, and, and I think um, that decision is going to be based more on, on, on issues like healthcare, on um, you know, the economy, which is working out pretty well for the Trump administration, jobs, that sort of thing. So if they can concentrate on messaging and, and staying disciplined on that, which is impossible with Trump, I know. But um, you know, we'll see how good a job the campaign does in sort of pushing these issues and helping the president uh, re be reelected. Yeah, Laura, you covered the 2018 midterms, of course, mm -hmm. often when the president would be parachuting into states, congressional districts. He, there are elections actually happening tonight in Kentucky mm -hmm. as well as Mississippi where the president's yeah. actually gone in and sometimes is able to move numbers. How do you, how do you see him as a force over the next year? Um, well, he can only parachute in so much given the fact that he's on the ballot this time around. So uh, it clearly helped some Republicans when he did do that in 2018. Uh, it probably helped in the special in North Carolina that we had a few months ago. Uh, but And there was actually a recent article uh, up that I believe that Politico wrote, and it was looking at how his impact on the Alabama Senate race in 2017, and some Republicans had said, oh, if he, or it was actually maybe Doug Jones who said it, someone who worked for Doug Jones, had said that if, if Trump had showed up earlier um, to back the Republican candidate, then maybe the Democrat would have lost. So um, he definitely will try to rally his supporters in that way. He does seem to have an impact when he's able to jump into these races. Uh, but again, he is on the ballot, so he's going to be stretched a little bit thin when it comes to that. Um, I do think that there has been some movement when it comes to, I mean, he steadily is about 40% in approval rating. Uh, but where we did see movement was on the impeachment front, which was that for a good amount of time, um, less than a majority supported impeachment, and now we have a majority of the country supporting impeachment. And yes, a, part, a big piece of that is divided along party lines, that it's much more Democrats that support it than Republicans, but there also is a sizable chunk of people who identify as independent voters that support the impeachment and removal of him. So that has been a dramatic change in the last few months, and we saw that, that drastic shift after the Ukraine um, transcript and scandal. Yeah. And Mike, I, I don't know if he's going to be able to rebuild the coalition that took him to, to the White House. And, and this includes anti-Hillary voters. And I think in part that's why the White House insists on uh, painting Biden as the ideal rival, because that's a candidate who, on the electability side for Democrats, they think can beat Trump on those key states, Rust Belt states. But also because I think uh, the, the, the Trump White House and his campaign, they think that's a candidate that they campaign with that same brush of anti-Hillary sentiment, and something that they wouldn't have with the other candidates, right? They, they have the socialists, so-called socialist, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, um, and, and then they have this like, um, establishment Democrat who's very much like the same type of rival that Hillary was in 2016. So, so it's key for, for Trump to rebuild that coalition and to have moderate Republicans, with, I mean, to, to take away an alternative for them. So someone that they'll say, I mean, I don't like Trump, but I'd rather vote for Trump than this person on the Democratic side. Yeah, that's a great point, Enrique. You know, when you ended up looking at Trump winning 46% of the popular vote, even with third party candidates, he can't afford any defections at all. On the other hand, I think to hit one of his biggest strengths, and I don't think anyone should ignore this, is he is a relentless campaigner. Mm -hmm. And he is going to throw mm -hmm. everything, every charge, probably try to be, be sure to deflate the other side. And yeah, and a piece of that relentless campaigning is the money aspect, right? Which he combined with the RNC has far outpaced the DNC when it comes to fundraising. Um, and that's something that Democrats are concerned about because while, while these candidates uh, and the so-called you know, more grassroots fundraising candidates like Warren and Sanders might look as though they're doing well um, money-wise, how does that translate once if one of them makes it to the general with a, a pretty anemic looking DNC? Uh, and that's an issue that a number of Democrats have been concerned about for years uh, because their party apparatus was pretty much gutted under Obama. And that's one of the things that they don't 
exactly thank Obama for, which is that he created a very separate organization, OFA, and that really hurt the DNC. Um, and so they're, Democrats are trying to figure out a way to rebuild it to make sure that they have uh, all of their things in order. And they've kind of actually instituted new policies to make it almost impossible for a future Democratic nominee to create an OFA-like organization, the Organizing for Action-like organization. So we talked about the money. We were talked about the relentless campaigning by the president, the social media that we're often seeing. One of the kind of final questions before we start getting into the, the questions from, from the audience is, what's the state of the American democracy right now? We are you know, 363 days before the next presidential election. How strong or fragile is this democracy? I think the Trump presidency has been a stress test to our institutions. Um, they have been tested in a way that they haven't been in decades, probably since the civil rights movement. Uh, or, or, or more than that, um, we never, even the founding fathers never thought that the threat to our uh, democracy was gonna come from the presidency or from the White House. Um, and it's certainly been the case, we were not equipped to deal with that threat and we've seen it play out in this impeachment uh, uh, investigation process. So, um, you know, I think that it's been important for all of us to realize that democracy doesn't work on autopilot, it requires efforts and sacrifices from all of us involved in, 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 in this work in progress that's called democracy. It's perfection, although it's never going to be perfect, but uh, in, in getting there. And, um, and, and, and some institutions have reacted better than others. It's tested the media, mm. whatever that is, because it's a lot of things, the, the media, but it's tested us. Um, it's tested our judicial system, um, the separation of powers, the work of Congress. Uh, so I think you know, they've all, we've all been tested during the, the last uh, couple or three years, and, and uh, hopefully the outcome will be a, a more perfect. Uh, yeah. um, you know, yeah, is this unit. country ready for the next year, Laura? <laughs> for the next well, six months, I don't, the next year. Journalist, I don't know. I'm already <laughs> exhausted, and it hasn't even fully started yet. Um, uh, I agree with a lot of what Enrique said about the stresses that it's placed on our institutions. Um, I don't think we fully will know the impact on our foreign policy, on our relationships with allies, on our um, on the the different agencies under our government, whether it's the EPA, the DOJ, um, diplomats. Uh, but I've covered Congress for the last eight years or so. So I'm constantly in the Capitol, you know, walking the halls of the Senate and the House. Uh, and I still do that even though now I've transitioned to be a, a reporter who covers the presidential campaigns because I feel as though it's, it just uh, helps me keep my edge a bit. Uh, but it is unlike, under Trump, Capitol Hill has been unlike anything I have ever experienced as a reporter before. Um, it is far more tense. Uh, and um, yes, it, it's far more polarized than it has ever been. It is very difficult to uh, find a Republican senator or House lawmaker who will stray from Trump. Uh, they have very much tethered themselves to the president, and part of that is because they, they feel as though their uh, re-elections live and die by him. I, I would add again, um, and, and this is in the form of a question. I don't know if this, this last three years, this administration has actually brought in more people into our political process. And if that's the case, then in the long run, it might end up being a good thing. Uh, you talk about the stress test. That's a great word. Uh, <clears throat> on our own profession as journalists. And when I was here at the University of Chicago back in April 2018, I ended up having my seminars about what the media got wrong in 2016 and how we can do a better job for 2020. What are some of the lessons that you guys might have learned from 2016 and what you're seeing now and how you're applying it to your own journalism? Um, it, it's a bit of what I said earlier, which was um, you know, making sure that our, our coverage is much more in-depth when it comes to other pieces of the electorate, so not just um, you know, there, there was this narrative somehow that came out of 2016 that reporters didn't cover uh, white working class voters enough, which I disagree with. I think that, that, that we covered that extensively. Um, and 
so it's very much you know trying to focus more on the other parts of the electorate, minority mm -hmm. groups, other other voting groups that I think need our attention just as much, and being able to cover it uh, accurately and well. And a piece of that is clearly diverse newsrooms. Enrique, yes, yeah. uh, I think diversity is a key word here, um, not just of, of 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 race and gender, but also points of view, and and generations mm -hmm. in, in our newsrooms. Um, I think that if, and we were saying this, uh, Mark, if the Rust Belt was this sort of undiscovered region during the 2016 campaign, and people say we didn't pay enough attention and we didn't have enough voices from that region uh, being part of, of our editorial decisions, I think the border is, is going to be the equivalent of that in 2020. Uh, you're from McAllen, mm -hmm. Texas. Um, you certainly uh, know what it is like to, to hear voters in places like Iowa or New Hampshire talk about the border without you know, really knowing what the experience of border communities really is. Um, and I think that's going to be important to bring in those voices. In, in a way, tragically, the El Paso uh, massacre did that because we, we, we paid attention to the people who were covering that story and to the voices that, uh, of the victims. And, and uh, hopefully, um, that'll be something that, that, that changes in, in our coverage. And I guess from the Univision experience, we were highly criticized for not following the traditional principles of journalism back in the 2016 race. We were the first uh, um, outlet banned from covering the Trump campaign mm -hmm. because of what happened in, in the primaries in Iowa when um, our, our flagship anchor, uh, Jorge Ramos, went into a, a press conference and, and decided to ask a question. And then President Trump asked uh, his security team to, to remove Ramos from, from that press conference. Um, so uh, we were not neutral in the sense that we don't think that there are issues in which balance and neutrality apply, because there's certainly not two sides to the story of family separation, for example. And, and, and I guess that's transformed the way others have covered the, the Trump presidency. Uh, I'm not saying for, for the better. I'm saying it's, it, it was a wake-up call to the, our false sense of, of balance and objectivity. And, and I think we have, we have perfected that to, to, to maybe change from the, a concept of objectivity to intellectual honesty, to recognize there are bias that, that exist, but to also recognize that accountability and transparency are, are, are equipped us better to deal with, with both political coverage and, 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 um, than, than back in 2016. Yeah, if I could, sorry, yeah. if I could no. just add. Yeah, I guess another lesson to me would be that uh, Reporters, I, I think, need to make sure that we aren't covering an election like this with, with um, the way we sometimes tend to cover politics, which is very much like a game, which is very much like access and, and, a, and just a game that this team said that, this team said that, oh, who's scoring points with this message? I think that we have to be very careful not to cover it in that way. And then also uh, one of the, you know, oh, covering, uh, Back to what Enrique said about the story of 2016 with the, with the Rust Belt, I think that moving forward, a, a section of the electorate that more and more we're looking at is suburban voters because very much uh, they were key in 2018 for Democrats, whether or not they still stay with Democrats or move back to Republicans is a question, and specifically white women uh, in the suburbs because they voted with white women voted with Trump uh, by significant margins in 2016. And so whether or not some of them are abandoning them is a big question heading into 2020. Yeah, more voices, making politics serious, the policy. I do think that in a lot of ways there have been corrections from 2016. My personal takeaway on what we got wrong in 2016 was everyone assumed Donald Trump was going to lose. Right. Hillary's got this in the bag. It explains why James Comey put out his letter two weeks before the election. Well, Hillary's going to be president. She needs to deal with this. It explains why emails was the number one story because, well, Hillary's going to win. She's going to have to deal with it. Why Barack Obama wasn't all that forceful on Russian interference. Well, Hillary's going to win, so we'll deal with it. Every step of the way, the decision was, well, we have all this figured out. And to me, and I think the, the biggest thing going forward is like, we don't have it figured out. We don't know who's going to win. There are surprises all the time in these kind of races. And we as reporters need to kind of always kind of keep that in mind. Mm -hmm. Last question before we get to the audience questions. If you guys could be in one state on the day before election day. Florida. 
<laughs> makes it easy for you. All right. Florida, and then I want to hear what Laura's answer. And, uh, but, but, but explain, other, other than... Other than that, is your home base? Yeah. Why? why, why? That it always no, flips? Is that yeah, what? Yeah. You have to be there. Yeah. Yeah, no, you go first. <laughs> um, I honestly, and my answer may change, but right now I am uh, looking a bit more at Arizona because I think yeah. it could flip. So. Yeah. Good answer. Yeah. So I would actually like to be in Texas. I know, <laughs> I know it's not going to turn blue probably in the next election, but the dynamics of that state, they're changing and they're changing really fast. And I cannot stress this enough. Uh, people, when, I, when they hear me say this, they're like, oh, sure, yeah. Uh, well, just look at, again, I've said this example. All the people from the IOP are like, again, you're going to talk about Harris County? <laughs> but it's just an amazing example. Uh, the, the, the Harris County judge, a, a Colombian, 27-year-old Colombian a, a gay immigrant who's uh, governing around 5 million people, a, controls a, a $5 billion budget. That's more than half of the governors in this country. And she's the first woman ever to hold that position, the first Latino, <laughs> Latina, Latinx. Um, and uh, you know, uh, that's when you see how things are changing in Texas, not the result of our presidential election, but how local elections, local officials, that, that, that the face of that political representation is changing. So, so I think it's fascinating. It was fascinating to see how young people came out to vote in Texas mm -hmm. in, in the mm -hmm. midterms. Uh, in numbers that you know we've never seen, not just in midterm elections, but national elections. So I, I, I actually like to be in Texas uh, on that day. As the Texan who was in college when Ann Richard was governor, the last person to win it statewide, I've always been a very big skeptic on Texas. Mm -hmm. But to your point, I do think that it really does show the urban-suburban versus rural battle in America and the Trump presidency. Mm -hmm. As you mentioned, Harris County, you have Tarrant County out in Fort Worth. I, I you know. I, I'd love to be in Texas. And see awesome. My band so we'll we'll minute. we'll be there together. <laughs> Great. Uh, well, thank you guys. This was a fantastic yeah. panel. Now I want to turn it over to some of the questions that we have, particularly starting with some some of the students. Hi, my name's Olafer. I'm my first year. Um, I think there's been a lot of doubt um, in this campaign as to the viability of the policies of a lot of the Democratic candidates, given the fact that. Um, the, the likelihood of winning the Senate over isn't necessarily as strong as winning the presidency. Mm -hmm. um, I was wondering whether you think um, flipping the Senate is necessarily tied to the presidency in this election, and um, if not, what the likelihoods are in relation to the presidency. You're asking if you think if the, if the White House flips, that then does that mean the Senate will flip? Yeah. Or? yeah. Um, I think that the top of the ticket definitely has an impact on Senate races, but the map, just on paper, does not look good for Democrats. Mm -hmm. um, it very much favors Republicans. <clears throat> so, uh, and also, I think Democrats have struggled a bit to find the best candidates in states that they need to. Um, and so this far out, it really remains to be seen. I would probably place my bet on Republicans holding the Senate. Um, you know, I think there's a, a, a growing frustration <laughs> with uh, paralysis in Washington. Um, you know, we're in a city like Chicago that has had to move forward with issues like immigration, climate change, because of the inaction, not just on an international scale, but on a federal level. And, and that's because of the hyper-polarized, hyper-partisanship um, climate we've seen in, 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 in Washington, operating in Washington. So I, I think there's, there's this growing frustration and this feeling that whoever wins the, the, the White House should have a sort of a legislative majority to, to at least during the first um, uh, two years be able to have a, 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 an agenda, that, a governing agenda. Otherwise, we, I think, are going to see some of what we've seen the last uh, 12 years. Um, nothing getting done there. And, and on issues, again, like immigration, where there's overwhelming consensus, uh, you just can't believe that Congress is not providing a permanent solution, a comprehensive immigration reform, for example. So, uh, so uh, there's a point in which in a democracy, the will of the majority has to be uh, materialized in public in policies and, and, and in laws. And, and hopefully, that will get people energized around uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, voting uh, in that way. And here's the other policy pickle for Democrats. Even if they do win back the Senate, 
you're going to have to convince Joe Manchin of West Virginia, yeah. Kirsten Sinema of Arizona, Chris Coons of Delaware to go along with it, and that's not going to be easy to ask. But for. if they did have one party rule, it would make uh, the president's, uh, if it is a Democrat, their job a lot easier to pass things. Uh, that being said, there is a question about how much Trump has changed the presidency. So if, uh, say, an Elizabeth Warren or a Bernie Sanders wins, uh, or uh, some of the other candidates who have talked, like Harris or others who have talked about using more of the executive uh, powers to enact some of their agenda, uh, how much would they be pushed to do that if the Senate is Republican? Sure. Um, and, and quickly, I'm doing a, a segment called Tacos with the candidates. So I sit down, I have tacos with them. and uh, um, <laughs> It's kind of nice because I've, I've gained like 12 pounds doing this. But, uh, <coughs> The tackles have been great. Um, so the, the, the thing about that is that the first question I ask every time is, so how are you going to unite the country? I mean, because this seems to be the most important issue at the moment. Mm -hmm. um, regardless of who wins, they're going to inherit this mess, right? And we're all constantly confronted and, and, and divided. And if you want to get anything passed in Congress, you're going to have to convince not just Republicans, even many in your own party. Mm -hmm. in, in, there's so, so these ambitious ideas about Medicare for all and you know, tuition-free uh, uh, college. Th that requires consensus. So um, character and leadership are going to be key in, in reaching that consensus and uniting the, the, the country. So I think that's probably the most important thing that we, we should expect from whoever wins the election in 2020. Next question, please. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Zoe. I'm also a first year here. Um, you mentioned earlier that the election will be decided on who actually turns out to vote and where, and also just referenced youth voter turnout and the huge jump that we saw. Um, I was wondering, based on what you've seen on the ground, what do you expect to see in regards to youth voter turnout and why? Well, I expect it to be big. I mean, if 2018 is any indication, because yes, uh, the it shows that uh, millennials and the Gen Z, I hope that I'm saying <laughs> that right. right, apologies, um, turned out in greater numbers than boomers and those older than boomers. So uh, if, you know, then logic would follow that that grows in 2020. Uh, I've seen, on the trail, I have seen uh, a lot of young people really energized, really engaged in a way that, that you haven't before. Um, so, and, and you also see campaigns, um, specifically ones like Warren's and some of Buttigieg's and definitely Sanders who are trying to expand um, that, that demographic and, and have them come to the polls more. You see a lot of the candidates paying more attention and having more events at uh, colleges and high schools than I think you have before, too. Um, so I, I, I was born in Mexico, and I, I, I've been you know, living between the US and Mexico for most of my life. But the past 10 years, I've been working as a journalist here. And I've had to cover most of the mass shootings that we've seen uh, uh, tragically happen in, in this country, from Newtown to um, Orlando, the Pulse uh, massacre, to Parkland, to you know, I hate to just go over the list. but. I think that's mobilizing younger voters in a way that it hadn't before. Um, hmm. I think that's in part what explains that surge in 2018, and also issues like climate change. I think that you are the generation who, um, I'm, I'm almost the same age as you are. Okay. <laughs> we are the generation that, that's going to feel the most adverse effects of, of climate change, and, and, and young people are very much aware of that, and, and they know that uh, elections have consequences sometimes on a global scale. And, um, and I think that's driving and energizing younger voters. So I'm hoping we'll see that reflected on the, in the polls. I would just add, though, that there is one story, there is one story that I think um, needs to be covered more, and I'm hoping to cover it more as the cycle progresses, but voter suppression. So um, there are efforts in key states, key battleground states, uh, that are uh, being carried out to not just suppress um, you know, the black or brown vote, but also to suppress young voters. Uh, because some people are very afraid uh, what that would mean if more and more young people would vote. Thank you. Next question. Hi, my name is Fernanda, and I'm a first year at the college as well. Hi. And you mentioned that um, Trump sort of doesn't have this um, 
Hillary um, enemy to antagonize, but he has had the Fab Four in Congress, and I was wondering if you could speak to how the Fab Four are sort of changing the shift in ideology in the party and what that means for a lot of the candidates who are seeking their endorsement. For example, we ju uh, just saw Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez endorse Bernie Sanders, and what does that mean for his campaign and um, maybe younger voter turnout as well? Right. Um, so three of the four have endorsed Sanders mm -hmm. of that Fab Four that you're talking about. Um, I, w I think Presley may endorse Warren, but that's just an educated guess. Um, so uh, Ocasio-Cortez, uh, I'm not sure she has a big constituency nationally when it comes to certain key states, but she definitely en energizes young voters. So that's what Sanders is hoping that she'll help him with, which is driving turnout amongst young voters and Latinos. She's in a swing with him now in Iowa <coughs> over the next few days, and he's going to use her as much as possible on the campaign trail. Um, I think that... When it comes to the attacks, yes, Trump and Republicans have very much tried to use Ocasio-Cortez and, and those other congresswomen in a way that they used Pelosi. So it's not exactly that different. It's just new boogie women that they're using. So they used Pelosi in 2018 and tried to tether uh, Democrats running in really competitive House districts to her by saying, if you vote for this Democrat, then you're voting for a San Francisco liberal agenda. So now they get to say that, but with a younger, different uh, woman and a woman of color uh, and say, oh, you're voting for a New York elite agenda or a socialist one, since Ocasio-Cortez also uh, describes herself as, de as a democratic socialist. So. Yes, I mean, the attacks will be different. If, if Sanders is at the top of the ticket, Republicans are going to lean heavily into the socialist uh, attacks. If Biden is at the top of the ticket, we've seen that he has tried to discredit Biden in a way that he did Clinton, which is um, paint Biden as very corrupt, which is what he tried to do to Clinton, um, despite the fact that uh, what Trump has been pushing about Biden has been conspiracy theories. So, um, yeah, I, I think that depending on who Democrats have at the top of the ticket, Republicans will have plenty to to latch on to. I would just add, I hope that the, the media doesn't characterize those attacks as the part of the demographic anxieties of the country and call it what, calls it, what it is, mm -hmm. right? Um, mm -hmm. they're, they're sexism and, and in many cases racism against um, a, a segment of, of, of the population that um, just looks different and it's different from, from what Trump supporters usually uh, look like. Thank you. Next question, please. Hello. My question is about voter suppression. You've already touched on this a little mm -hmm. bit. But uh, I had a friend who in 2016 correctly predicted uh, that Trump would win using Nate Silver's 538 database, mm -hmm. even while Nate Silver himself predicted incorrectly. And he contends that what uh, Nate Silver uh, ignored was voter suppression. And he used a very simple formula, which is that in any state with a Republican governor and two houses that were Republican, there would be at least 5% loss hmm. due to voter suppression. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to hear your comments on this and a little more maybe on what can be done in the future, particularly in states like Wisconsin, right. you know, where 66% where of the voters are Democrats, yet a majority of the House seats by about the same amount are Republican. I mean, we've been talking about 2018, and, and I think Georgia is a good example of, mm -hmm. of, of how border suppression can certainly play a, 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 a role in the, the result of, of an election that, that seemed closer than many of us, um, you know, uh, ended up seeing in, 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 at the end of the day. I, I think it also explains why uh, when we talk about the power of the Latinx vote and how it represents or could represent up to 13% of the total electorate, it never reflects in, uh, in, in participation. And, and people have to realize that you know, border suppression laws hit uh, vulnerable communities, minorities like the Latinx community uh, harder than, uh, than others. Also, uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, Border suppression, not just through border ID laws or restrictions, but through the lack of resources for these um, 
minority communities in terms of getting them out, you know, campaigns mm -hmm. to, for them to get out to vote, to register. That, that's also a hurdle in, in, in them getting to, to the polls eventually. You know. And I, uh, yeah, a lot of this has to do with very much local elections, right? Have a big impact on voter suppression, and Democrats have been a bit slow to realize that. And so they're now launching efforts, whether it's Stacey Abrams or Andrew Gillums in Florida, to try to, to, try to mobilize um, and make sure that they're boosting registration and, and file lawsuits when are needed. Um, but Again, yes, there's plenty of examples of this across key states. I think Georgia just this week per, is, is planning to or has purged some 300,000 voters from the rolls, um, an effort by the governor there uh, to suppress the vote. So uh, I haven't been able to look into yet what the response is going to be to that. Uh, I think that... Uh, the press probably is another factor of this, right? We need to cover it more closely and we need to cover it more aggressively and give it the airtime that it needs. Yeah. If you are a Democrat, though, the good news is that you now have a Democrat as governor of Wisconsin, Democrat as governor of Michigan, Democrat as governor of Pennsylvania. So that is improved for your party. These governor's races do end up mattering a whole lot. But from a suppression standpoint, outside of what you end up doing at the state level, to me, the concerted part in 2016 was what Steve Bannon and others were working on, on using social media to really mm -hmm. depress African-American mm -hmm. and Latino votes and castigating Hillary Clinton, bringing up comments about her being a super predator and right. things that are already lined up about. Like, so if Joe Biden is the nominee, we're going to bring up Anita Hill. If Elizabeth Warren's the nominee, we're going to do this or that. And so there are, I think, concrete examples that politicians play, mm -hmm. but also what campaigns do with social media just to deflate key parts of the Democratic base. Mm -hmm. Rachel. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. <coughs> I'm. Bless you. Thank you. I'm Andrew Wise. I'm a second year master's student at the Harris School of Public Policy. And my question is somewhat two pronged. So, um, well, earlier or you, or you, you mentioned unity and, and reuniting the country, with, um, which seems to be the, which seems to be the key message of Joe Biden, who's, who's currently the, the Democratic front runner. Mm -hmm. he, he, I forget his exact words, but it was, once Trump's gone, and you're going to see a lot of good Republicans return to their senses or something to that, uh -huh. to, to that effect. Mm -hmm. And I guess my question is two parts. One is, is, how, is how realistic is it that at the next Democratic president or indeed president of either party will actually be able to to unite the 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 country given um, given what we saw uh, when president obama and re relentlessly reached out to republicans mitch mcconnell fought him at every turn and succeeded beyond his, beyond his wildest dreams so i i don't see what mcconnell's incentive is not to, to do that again and, and the second thing that I've often wondered about is why is it that enacting bipartisan policies is viewed as inherently a good thing, given just in my lifetime, policies like the Iraq War, bank deregulation, the Patriot Act, the Defense of Marriage Act, good. all had broad bipartisan support, mm -hmm. whereas policies like the Affordable Care Act, um, Dodd-Frank, which created the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, mm -hmm. passed in very close votes of all, almost strictly along party lines. Laura, why don't you take a stab at the question on does bipartisanship actually matter? And Enrique, to the other, the first part of the question on can they all come together in kumbaya uh, if the Democrats win in 2020? Right. So um, on the bipartisanship question, uh, yeah, I mean, you make, you make a, a very good point, which is that, um, which I think that we're seeing the, the backlash to that, right? Which, which is that there are younger, more, a more aggressive Democratic base that is tired 
of um, bipartisan, conventional wisdom way of operating in Washington, D.C. And it, it's a little bit of what probably also helped Trump win, which is that they're very tired of, of, of the slow pace of progress. Um, and so uh, I think that's why this election will potentially show us whether or not there are enough people across the country that that are tired of that, uh, particularly in who wins the Democratic nomination. So if someone like Warren wins the Democratic nomination, then you'll have your answer to whether or not people are, uh, Democratic voters are exhausted with, with, um, with the way Washington operates and that they don't believe Biden's answer, uh, which is that, uh, I can make Washington operate the way it used to again, which a lot of Democrats don't seem to even want. Uh, they don't necessarily want the Washington the, that operated under Obama. Um, I think, thanks for your question, questions. Um, I think uh, the, the election is also going to be a referendum on our democracy, not just a, a presidential election, but also a sort of a, again, referendum on, on our democracy, and in that sense, our democratic values. And, I think during his last State of the Union, President Obama mentioned that his biggest regret, regret was not being able to bring the country together and, and overcome that, that divide that he, he, you know, he encountered in, in Congress. Um, I don't see a, a way in which we could move forward in, in this status quo of paralysis and, 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 and hyper polarization much longer. I mean, that's taking away from our strength, from our institutional strength, from our strength as a, you know, as a, as a world um, a superpower. Um, so, so I think it has to be resolved. I'm not sure how, but if, if, if we don't find a, a, the incentives to sort of um, come out of this process more united, it, it's, it's really, I would say, the start of the of the end of our of, of our um, mm. superpower status or sole superpower status, I mean, and, and and we can go into detail into that and say, well, that's being you know, challenged by China and, and other uh, um, uh, agents and, and actors. But but I do think that in, in that sense, that's probably the most consequential part of the 2020 election. And how are we going to solve this this uh, paralysis? Next question, please. Thanks. Hi. Um, I want to ask if the press is missing a couple of other issues you've talked about, a couple they may have been missing. W one is they're missing the democratic process of looking at polls. I think, of course, correction-wise, we know polls are useless right now, and that Jimmy Carter, uh, um, um, Kerry, and uh, Clinton all did lousy the year before the election, mm -hmm. and yet they're like trying to wipe out those kind of people with using polls as a way of doing the, the, the uh, debates. And then the turn voter suppression, the Democrats are suppressing voters more than anyone else because they won't let independents vote. 14 states, it's totally closed elections, and many states, including my own of Arizona, the semi-closed where you have to mm -hmm. put your name out and change your party. Mm -hmm. in order to vote. And those are issues I'm, I, I think are not in, covered enough, and I want to see if I'm wrong about that. Uh, when it comes to polls, I mean, the, the decision to make polls the deciding de facto in the debates was the DNC's. It's not the press. So but it's, they could criticize it, they could discuss it. It's not really being discussed. Right, but that's a party's decision to do that. Uh, it's not, uh, and we've covered it, that, that this has been a very heavy-handed uh, way by the DNC to winnow the field, and they chose to do that because they didn't want what the Republicans had in 2016. So, um, We've written about it as clear as day that that has been what their decision was. Uh, and again, it, it is very much up. I wouldn't say that that necessarily has made it harder for any of the candidates. I mean, you, you either are strategic and are able to rise and get the amount of donations. It's not just polls. It's also a po combination of polls mixed with the contributions that you get, uh, or, or you're not. Um, 
Now, that being said, one of the issues with it is that a candidate like Tom Steyer has effectively been able to buy his way onto the debate stage. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just my, my pushback on the polling question. Um, when it comes to whether or not primaries and caucuses are open or not, I think that we've covered that. Could it be, could it be <coughs> more potentially? But um, but Democrats have also, in certain cases, tried to make changes to to the primaries to allow independents to vote. Recently, they've taken more uh, more steps to do that, and I think that they're in the process of uh, trying to figure out how to even change it from this cycle to the next. I think that w this is where we miss local media, right? Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen a decline in local coverage, and that was particularly important in, in the local political process. Um, and, and they cover it much better than we could because they know the players better, because they know the issues better, they know the community better. And, and, and this decline in local uh, media platforms and, and, and outlets, I think, has hurt the way we understand the the local political process. Um, and on the part of uh, polls, I would just add that I think we're placing, uh, you know, uh, the, the problem is not the polls, but our expectations of what the polls can 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 bring to our coverage. It's not a good predictor of future uh, um, decisions. It's, it's actually just better at taking the temperature of past uh, uh, decisions. I, I think that's what polls are, are helpful for. Um, because it doesn't predict how much people are going to come out and vote, and you know, it doesn't predict why and what what, what issues are usually going to uh, bring uh, voters out on, on election day. What they say a year from the election is usually very different from what happens on election day. Um, so I, I think that in, in that sense, we're also playing uh, placing too much of an expectation on, on polls to explain our sort of our you know the state of our politics. Yeah, and at least on the debate. Front, you know, this was not a perfect setup at all, but you had 20 odd candidates. How do you actually try to reduce things? And to Laura's point, every candidate was told back in February, here's the rules on making the debates. And so people did know. But I think to your question, and a friend of mine, Jonathan Roush, just recently wrote this piece about would a guy like Abraham Lincoln in, you know, the 1860s have actually been able to make the debate stage and like the former one term congressman from Illinois uh, been able to do it and possibly not. And the kind of question is, is this all process we have where we go for four months and everyone has a primary or caucus a good thing? I do think democracy is a political reporter. I think it's great. But if you're trying to just win, baby, is this the best system that you can actually come up with? I think there's a legitimate debate about mm -hmm. it. I'm just curious to hear your perspective on the term fake news and how it's going to have a role in the reporting of the election, if any. Well, I, I think that if it's fake, it's not news. So I don't, I don't believe in the term and I don't accept it. Uh, I think mis we talked about this, you talked about this earlier today. Um, you know, misinformation and propaganda play a huge role in, 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 in uh, the, the result of our, our elections. It, it happened in 2016, and I think we all learned from it individually. I think we should be more concerned and more responsible with how we consume and share information. Hopefully, we, we all have made that uh, decision and conscious decision to, to be more careful, to verify information, to just navigate our, our, our way through this sort of a overwhelming offer of, of content and information better. And um, also, I, I hope that our you know, government and our election officials have taken note of what happened and, and are much more careful of, of you know, how they guard our, our democratic process. Laura. Um, the term fake news. I, uh, look, uh, Trump has very much weaponized you know, that against the press, has, has tried to discredit the press, and yet uh, the vast majority of journalists I know, and I'll speak for myself, um, why I got into this was to hold powerful people accountable no matter what your party is, uh, no matter what place of government you hold. And of course, we're going to hold you accountable if you're the president of the United States. So um, we're not, reporters are not supposed to be politicians, friends. Uh, we're not supposed to paint a perfect brush of anyone. Um, it's. Uh, but we do come with the facts and with the truth. And so um, I would hope that the public sees that uh, this election cycle and that we just are as diligent 
uh, as we possibly can be. And I just want to kind of give an origin on the whole fake news. This was not even a term until the general election of 2016, and it actually started coming about. There were these kind of content mills in Romania and Eastern Europe. They were creating all this content saying that the Pope endorsed <laughs> Donald Trump. That is fake news. Also, in my hometown of Washington, D.C., there's this place called Comet Pizza or Comet Ping Pong oh, Pizza, God. and everyone said Hillary Clinton was running a pedophile sex slave ring in Washington, D.C. at this, uh, at this family pizza place mm -hmm. where after the election, someone actually brought in a gun to actually save the children. That was also fake news. Yes. Fake news is not journalism that we get wrong and we're not perfect. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we sometimes either have a copy editing error or we get a we have to have a correction in our stories. It's also not news that you necessarily disagree with, which how the president the ended idea. up appropriating the term. And to me, I do think and I'll just agree with you guys that it, it is very disturbing for the foundation of our democracy on news that when someone, and particularly the president of the United States says I disagree with that or that put me in an unfavorable light. That is actually fake news. And seeing other world leaders pick up on it, to me, is maybe the most disturbing development that we've had, at least in journalism, over the last four years. And so I'm really glad you brought that up. And we, I think we have time for one more question before we, we get to the concluding remarks. Yes. Uh, so you would mentioned earlier that um, the press aren't supposed to be friends of politicians. And do you think accusations of bias of news organizations across both sides of the aisle are legitimate? You'd mentioned that the, the president in large part has attempted to delegitimize the media, but is any of the responsibility on the media themselves for the, the bias leading to how easy it is to delegitimize them? Yes, go ahead. Uh, <laughs> could you repeat the, yeah. yeah, or unless you want to take it, Mark, could you repeat the end of your last question? Of your uh, question? Do you think there's validity to accusations of bias on, uh, against news organizations on both sides of the aisle, and have they themselves made it easy to le delegitimize them by you know, not being as nonpartisan as they could be? So I think that um, there's a lot of misconceptions about certain outlets, and I think that even just interactions with my own family that don't know much about how reporters operate or how journalists operate, is that there's this idea that if your editorial board or if the, the editorial side of your newspaper or your publication leans a certain way or skews a certain way, be it conservative or be it you know, center left, that that must mean that the entire organization does, and that's not accurate. So. Um, when I have been a reporter, and I've actually worked for conservative-leaning news sites mm. and very progressive-leaning news sites. I worked for Huffington Post for two and a half years. I worked for the Washington Examiner for a year. And never once did what was viewed as the owner of that paper's viewpoints or the editorial viewpoints of that paper influenced my writing. So. Could the press potentially do a better job sometimes of showing that delineation? Yes, um, I think that we could. Uh, I, th I think that, um, that, that, as Mark was saying, there is a, we're in a bit of a dangerous moment when it comes to the press because there is the rise of a lot of publications that very much do traffic in fake news, whether it's Breitbart or um, other right-leaning publications. Um, and so there's, I think, steps that the press needs to take to ensure that, that, that those things are pointed out. That those Enrique, do you have out. a quick? I would say I don't think we're part of the problem. We're part of the solution. And we're not the enemy here. We're not certainly the enemy of the people. I think we are. are a, a, a fundamental, a foundational part of our um, democracy. Um, I come from a country where journalists are killed every day for doing their job, and I find the president's comments that are, you know, extremely dangerous and, and detrimental to the work of many of my colleagues, not just in the U.S. but around the world. I think transparency and accountability, like I said before, should apply also to newsrooms, and I think we're doing a better job of sort of a opening up the kitchen to show people how we go about our process. Um, and, and I think if, if you have a, a sort of a criticism on uh, a specific platform or an outlet or a reporter, you should uh, engage with them and, and, and sort of a, try to have a conversation about what it is that you think that it's not working out in terms of bias. 
there is bias in the sense that whoever is making the editorial decisions sometimes has a, 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 you know, a, a, an experience with an issue. Um, the lack of diversity in our newsrooms also reflects, I think, uh, some, some bias. But I don't think there's a bias in the sense that there's a, a, you know, a conspiracy to try to derail the, the president or his presidency or, or sort of you know, operate against any particular candidate. I think there's a, a commitment to the truth, to, to rigorous and professional work. And I think it, the, the, the press, it's probably the, the, one of the best and, 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 and most important institutions that, that this country has, one of the healthiest institutions that this country has, and, and we should all cherish it. Thank you for your question. You and I just want to thank Enrique for joining on this panel. Thank Laura, Gretchen, Noah. Thank you for the introductions. Uh, it's fantastic. As was mentioned, I was a former fellow a year ago uh, here. This is such a special community. It's great hearing from all of you guys. It's so great that you guys are interested in the election that's coming up. I think you know we'll see what ends up happening. It's going to be a great story one way or the other. And be sure to continue to be engaged, because to me, that is the essence of our democracy. It's the essence of being reporters. And uh, so keep on keeping on. And great, great <laughs> moderating. Yeah.